Directors are trying everything. Everyone is experimenting and seeing what works and like what doesn't. And I think that's like very exciting that the structure of film is played with a lot in the 2000s. Welcome back. We're doing another episode of the Decades Draft. This time it's the 2000s. We're joined by some wonderful guests. My name is Eric. I am a writer. I just had a novel come out a couple of years ago and I have a second one coming out. Hopefully in the future, I'm still in the process of writing and editing. Before that, I was a stage actor in the city of Chicago. But yeah, I love movies and I'm very excited to be here. So thank you for having me again. I want to say, first of all, thanks to you both for having me on. Really looking forward to this today. It's going to be fantastic, I think. Uh, my name is Kai. Um, I work in the health industry in the UK. Um, but when I'm not doing that, what I'm usually up to is ravenously writing reviews all over Letterboxd. Big, long rambles about just how much I love pretty much every film I've ever seen. The players will be doing a snake draft, which means that the turn order will swing back and forth until every player has completed their lineup. The players have brainstormed ahead of time and should have backups for each category just in case their first choice gets taken. The categories are horror, comedy, kids slash animation, award winner, non-American production, and female lead. It does not matter what order the categories are filled out as long as the players have one of each by the end of the draft. The players will not talk about potential picks in order to avoid spoiling anyone's choices or influencing their decisions. Once a player names a film on their turn, they must lock it into one of the categories. As a group, the players can decide that a film doesn't count. This film could no longer be selected by any of the players. The players will maintain a good attitude, even if another player drafts one of their top choices. And most importantly, remember to have fun. For my first pick, I'm going to start us off with the female lead category. I'm choosing one of my favorite films of all time, the 2001 surrealist Hollywood mystery film Mulholland Drive, written oh. and directed by David Lynch. This film stars Naomi Watts and Laura Herring and is a subconscious cerebral story of this actress who moves to L.A., and she's going into town and she's going to get her big break. And she crosses paths with this amnesiac who is being pursued by the powers that lurk in the underbelly of the city of dreams and is quickly catapulted from a dream into a nightmare. Something that I really, really love about Mulholland Drive and what first like sucked me into it when I first saw it was the structure of the film. It's unlike any other film I have ever seen. It can be interpreted on so many different ways, whether it's like, are we seeing like a series of true events? Are we seeing dreams? Are we seeing memories? Uh, the film itself is structured like a puzzle and it's very rewatchable. Like th there's so many just little details and little lines that add to the mystery and make it really, really grow. It's incredibly atmospheric. There are just these very great musical sequences that just have some of the best cinematography and timing I've ever seen in a film. It's a phenomenal, phenomenal, one of a kind film with perhaps one of the best twists, I think, in cinema, but also one of the rawest emotional journeys in cinema about like love, desire, passion, everything that goes into film is somehow deconstructed and like put back together by this movie. I absolutely love it. I find Mulholland Drive to be one of the most uncomfortable experiences I've mm -hmm. probably had with David Lynch and I'm still not entirely sure I can put my finger on why. Which which is the wonderful thing. Um, it's really the marvelous thing that I'm still completely confounded by it all these years later in a wonderful way and in a way that I think was far more successful here than maybe in other, you know, surrealist films, especially in the noughties. It's very unsettling, and at times it's genuinely frightening. The other thing I find that is at like the heart of the movie that is like really troubling for me is that it feels like there's some sort of alluding to what goes on when someone who's like young and hopeful gets to Hollywood. Much like the hotel and the shining, there's like an evilness to it. I feel like David Lynch is saying there's a real evilness here in this town as well. Yeah, there's a real energy throughout 
uh, Mulholland Drive that just I think tweaks something in 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 your brain and just immediately says to you this is not right. There's some I don't know if it's spoilery, but there are like technical errors that are put there on purpose that are there to mm -hmm. make you feel like uncomfortable. I'm going to be taking the 2007 American classic written and directed by Paul Thomas Anderson, There Will Be Blood. Um, this is loosely based off the uh, Upton Sinclair novel Oil. It's about an oil man who, with the help of his adopted son, uh, comes to a town, uh, Little Boston, swindles the locals of their land, uh, and expands his oil empire. I don't know if it's about, like, capitalism or religion and the Bible or, you know, the birth of Los Angeles or, you know, family um to me it's like the most important movie of the 21st century when i think about what film students are going to be watching a hundred years from now this to me is the movie that they're going to be uh examining in, in classes whatever that looks like paul thomas anderson is like such a mesmerizing director i almost feel like hypnotized when i'm watching his movies and this particular movie is like a great example of the very big and the very small when daniel is is screaming at the top of his lungs about abandoning his child like the movie is very big and then you also get these like extended set pieces of like oil like exploding from the ground and in the very small you'll get like daniel sitting with hw on a train it, it's such an incredible movie to watch dylan for you to immediately go for what is potentially it's constantly jostling with first place it is either my first or second favorite film of all time i mean there's so much to talk about with there will be blood i mean you made a lot of points about what the film is about i mean even even taken the first time I saw it as an allegory for America in general, American mm. industrialism and American capitalism and, you know, what you will abandon in pursuit of the almighty dollar. And even on that level, there is so much to unpack and to discuss. But then, as you said, if you take it on the religious level, it is arguably the religious aspect of the story is far more important than where you initially start. The central drama of the film becomes less about this man's loss of of humanity in pursuit of fortune and more morality and the clashing of a rock and a hard place and both sides are equally terrible lost fallen people at the end of the day this is the story of greed and like what greed does to someone and how it warps someone completely the only thing that's keeping him going is like revenge against this wrong that has been done to him and it is about yeah how like religion is weaponized by like class it's about opportunity and familial love and like fathers and sons how quickly greed will erode a person and and not even necessarily with the daniel day lewis character but you mm. see the wider effect on every single person who he comes into contact with it is this tidal wave of just dread and grief mm. and just by the end of it there's no light at the end of that mm. tunnel at all also robert ellsworth's cinematography in this movie is mm. just like unbelievable there's nothing distracting the use of like tracking shots and like the way that the camera lingers on certain characters as well the lighting in this movie is just like unbelievable oh boy okay i'm gonna go ahead and do um my non-american choice i am taking uh let the right one in uh the 2008 swedish romantic horror film directed by tomas alfredson based on the 2004 novel of the same title by John Linkvist, starring Corey Hedebrandt and Lita Leanders. Set in the early 80s in a suburb of Stockholm, 12-year-old Oscar is a lonely outsider who's bullied at school by his classmates, and at home he dreams of revenge. He befriends the mysterious neighbor next door, who only appears at night in the snow-covered playground outside their building. This is one of the most beautiful movies I've ever seen, like visually and just like the story. It's so simple, and if you take away the vampire element, it's still a very like horrific story about these kids who do really violent things and like don't care it's super beautiful that it's mostly like black and white with like the only colors being the blood and the rubik's cube and like a couple red clothing items but mostly everything else is really dull and like very desaturated what you say about how beautiful it looks i don't know how they made night look like so dark in that film and something that the cinematography in that film captures so well is the loneliness that is 
is in that film. Like those two kids are just like your heart, even though they do these horrible things and there's like all this like violence and the vampirism, it's like your heart goes out to them because without almost any dialogue, just like by putting them in certain places in the shot, it's like, this is just like, these are the two loneliest kids that have ever lived on this earth. For me, Let the Right One In is, if not the best vampire tale of the modern era, it is top three at least. And even yeah. then saying that, I'm struggling to think of what I might prefer to it. It's a vampire movie in the sense that there is one in it. That is the least interesting thing going on within the plot. These are two of the most fascinating characters I've ever witnessed in horror. There's so much going on and they are both likeable and intriguing and yet also horrifying and there's this undercurrent throughout. It's, you know, we've all said something about how beautiful the film is, but it's, it's almost as if the beauty of the film and how incredible it looks only serves to contrast even further with just how dark the undercurrent around everything going on with these characters is. Ely's relationship with Huacan as well, like, they don't explore it very much in the movie, but if you've read the book, uh, it's yes. very dark. <laughs> I'm, I'm basically just gonna agree with you guys. Hoyt Van Hoysema is just, like, absolutely on one. It, it's really one of the most stunning movies to just look at. I don't know about you guys, but I didn't find the ending of this movie, like, pleasant at all. Yeah. Yeah, the ending um, is disguised as a very cheerful, happy ending. Especially if you, one, know Morse code and two, know Swedish. Um, mm -hmm. he, he spells out kiss in Swedish on the box. It's it's cute and sweet and romantic and also very scary and sad. Just go, just circling back to like the vampire story of it all as well. The way that they like make that work in like a Soviet era block like mm. people disappear and like there's a weird serial killer. The vampireness of it all like really works as well. It's like they really get it, you know? I really love that in this film they bring back a lot of the traditional vampire things. Like, like they can't come in unless they're invited. They can't eat real food. They're allergic to the sun. Cats don't like them. And also kind of interestingly explored in some ways. Um, you know, you mentioned the the inviting in. That scene is genuinely alarming. Even knowing it's it's coming, I think every time that happens, I just sort of like sit mouth agape going, oh my god, no. Oscar doesn't verbally invite Elian, but he goes... Yes. And that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work when he does that. You have to verbally say it, I guess. Uh, another shout out that I want to mention is that Lena Leanders, they thought that she looked perfect for the role of Ely, but they did not think that her voice was scary enough. So another actor voiced over yeah. all of her dialogue. Oh, I didn't know that. That's yeah. Cool. yeah that's Every single that. part of dialogue from, from Ely, the entire movie was uh, Elif Palin. Amazing job because they wanted her to sound more menacing and she was too cute. She looks perfect for the part. She has beautiful eyes. Mm -hmm. Every time there's like close up of her mm -hmm. eye color, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. especially in the end in the in the pool scene, there's like a really yes. close up shot of her eyes. Yeah, talk about like um just the build up to the pool climax is like man, you you really feel rewarded as an audience member. Mm -hmm. That's all I'll say for like mm -hmm. sticking around. Like that movie rocks. I, I do like that movie a lot. So I'm gonna go with a horror pick first, and um you know again can't blame you. You you took the words right out of my mouth with with that pick. Um so I have to go with one of my secondary picks. And the example I've got here is 2004's Dumplings, directed by Fruit Chan. Adapted by director Fruit Chan from a shorter half-hour version, Dumplings is the tale of a former actress, played by Miriam Young, who feels that her looks are fading, is starting to notice her husband looking at younger women and looking with bad intent, and she hears tale of this local chef named Aunt May, played by Bai Ling. And this character of Aunt May turns up immediately all smiles and says, I have this wonderful recipe for dumplings that will make you feel incredibly rejuvenated and your husband will start to find you attractive again and you will feel that youth that you feel that you've lost. And Mrs. Lee takes her up on this offer. But as she begins to feel the effects and start to look a bit more into Aunt May, the closer she gets to quite the horrifying secret. It is a very down-to-earth, quite sad story at times about a woman who feels that her best years are behind her and feels unwanted by the man in her life and, you know, forgotten by the world that she left of acting and is just desperate to regain a little bit of power back in the best way that she feels fit, no matter what the cost. It is an incredibly dark movie. It deals with a extremely taboo subject, and I, I, I can't say more due to spoilers. One thing I can say is that whilst 
reception on this movie, especially on Letterboxd, may be more of the mixed variety. The people who get it, and the people for whom it resonates, it really resonates. And this, to me, is a lot more than a simple drama, which it also is. It's more than a simple horror. This film has stuck with me. Shot exquisitely as well by Christopher Doyle, which elevates everything from the mundane to the outrageous to just such an incredible height with his beautiful cinematography. I'm, I'm going to jump from horror straight into the comedic and go from one of the harshest films that I've ever had the the fun of recommending to one that I adore. Um, it has got to be Scott Sanders' 2009 film Black Dynamite. There is no one tougher, there is no one better, there is no one who can kick more ass than Black Dynamite. This film is a gem. This film is minute to minute, laugh out loud, hilarious, and yet feels like there was barely effort put into it. Michael J. White is incredible in this and he completely understands the assignment with the black exploitation sort of homage love fest that this film is that movie is like a perfect black exploitation parody homage like a mixture of the two of like having basically this very thin plot that they just stretch in every possible direction not only is the dialogue really funny the 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 slipshod filmmaking and the sight gags like you will see like the boom mic will like boom fall mic. into the shot you'll see actors miss their mark and like walk a little too far and then like correct themselves. Okay, so for my horror choice, uh, I'm gonna pick uh, Saw from 2004, the American horror film directed by James Wan in his feature debut and co-written with Lee Winnell. Obsessed with teaching his victims the value of life, a deranged, sadistic serial killer abducts the morally wayward. Once captured, they must face impossible choices in a horrific game of survival. The victims must fight to win their lives back or die trying. This movie kicked off, or was one of the movies that kicked off what we know as like the torture porn era. It was one of the first like super gory movies that I saw and and at the time, I hated it. And then looking back, it's like a masterpiece. This movie had like no budget. It was one location. Half the people in it were the crew. It's just... <sighs> This, the effects are crazy. I tend to have quite a big problem with the franchising of horror movies, but in the case of Saw, mm -hmm. I, I do not mind at all, because especially as you said, as part of this, you know, what was at the time this new outrage, you know, especially in the meat of this torture porn genre, I think Saw is probably the best one. It includes torture, and it includes suffering. It's not actually about that. Mm -hmm. uh, the most interesting part of Saw is the mystery. The screenplay is incredible, and it constantly throws new developments at you, almost sort of like whip-fast. But at no point do you feel overwhelmed, or you need a reminder of what's going on. Because of the small setting and the very, very short cast of characters, there isn't that much to follow. Really simple, pulled off impeccably. I... One of the best plot twist endings I can think of. I love like small details that you notice on a rewatch as well. Like every time Jigsaw is on screen, the whole thing is kind of green. I also love like this movie is very like tinted, like everything is blue or green and they continue at that throughout the franchise as well. It kind of feels like an Evanescence music video. I, I think if you were to boil the 2000s American horror down to one film, that would be like one of the things that would come out because mm. it's very iconic. It's like you said, it, it ha the mystery is so good that there is rewatchability when you have like such a tiny budget and you need to like stretch everything like to its maximum effectiveness like saw does that and just how claustrophobic that movie is too like it, it uses the setting so effectively it's brilliant like really brilliant and to think that was james wan's like first feature is yeah. insane it's so incredible particularly with horror as a genre how it can just continue to like reinvent itself over and over again and for a movie like this to just like come along and like completely upend the trajectory of horror movies for like the next 10 years at least it's mm -hmm. just it, it's such an achievement i love that the franchise is for people who are just here for the gore and the kills like they get what they what they want but the people who care about the story like they actually it's such a deep story that continues for 20 years they're still doing it and it's they're still weaving things into the story and there's been dozens of copycat kind of death game movies since then if nothing has come close to being as no. good as saw mm -hmm. oh boy 
Okay, in the international category, I am going to select the 2003 South Korean uh, Revenge Epic by oh, Park boy. Chan-wook. I'm going to take Old Boy. Ode Su is a obnoxious alcoholic who is kidnapped uh, and held in captivity for 15 years. He is suddenly released and has five days to get his revenge on his captors. I mean, for my money, it's like the, the best 21st century revenge movie. And the whole conceit of the movie is like, is the revenge even worth it? I can't think about this movie without thinking about like the dance music at the start and the holding the guy over the, the edge of the building. It's just like one of the most like electric openings to a movie ever there are just so many like scenes that you watch where you're like what the hell is happening right now the cinematographer is chung chung hoon and he did such a good job just like the incredible close-ups in that film just how uncomfortable like he makes every single shot and like that hallway fight is one of the best i think in cinema history it's incredible how a film that is this dark and this visceral and this full-on is also as funny as it is it's as close to a black comedy as I think a film like this can get without either tipping over into black comedy or just complete absurdity. It, it is Park Chan-wook's best film. And it's his best work on a, a wide variety of levels. I mean, if you want to talk about intricacy in plot, Old Boy takes you on a two-hour journey of twists and turns and twisting back upon itself and changing loyalties and twists that boggle the mind even now throughout the film. And then the story and the characters. And, you know, there's a lot of praise that has to go to Troy Min-sik for his outstanding lead portrayal as Ode Su. It's one of those rare movies where substance and style meet equally. And just the depiction of like forlorn love brutality that sort of neo-noir mystery that's at the heart of the movie as well it's really so expertly crafted and they also get to claim it as a co-production of new zealand as well the the very last yes. scene of the movie is, is was made out here for some yeah. reason i guess they don't have snow in, in south korea <laughs> my next pick is the four hour long japanese romantic epic written and directed yes. by shion sono Love Exposure. Love Exposure stars Takahiro Nishijima, Hikari Mitsushima, and Sakura Ando. And it is... In a sense, if I were to say in a sense what it's about, it's about love. Everything that is love. Like, I think when people think of love films, they think of, like, romantic comedies or, like, Disney-fied love, you know, where it's, like, very, like, two people fall in love and that's kind of it. But this film deals with, like, the depths of love, where it's also, you know, you've got things like platonic love and, like, familial love, but also how love is, like, very sexual and perverted, and it plays with the idea of, like, being so obsessed with someone that you want to, like, sleep with them, and how that's kind of fucked up. And it tackles like so many themes and it's like four hour runtime and, and not a single minute is wasted. I think I was I was hooked when I first watched this like a couple years ago. I saw a review on Letterboxd of this film that called it Catholic Guilt the anime. Ultimately, it's a film not just about, like, the healing, redemptive power of love, which it definitely is, but it's a film about, like, embracing perversion and, like, being perverted for Jesus and, like, uh, this radical transformative power that comes into someone's life when love is exposed to them. It's a life-changing movie, impeccable timing, impeccable pacing, and an impeccable Beethoven and City Pop soundtrack. Um, it's, it's one of the most absurd movies Movies I've ever seen and I mean that absolutely as a compliment it's a film that's very hard to recommend but one that um, should be experienced yeah you you almost lost me at four hour and then you got me back at Catholic guilt the anime if you like films about religion I would say check it out if you like foreign films check it out if you like anime definitely check it out I'm going to go with the award-winning category and my award-winning film is the 2005 Academy Award winner for best director best adapted screenplay and best score I'm talking about Ang Lee's Brokeback Mountain directed by Lee and written by Larry McMurdy and Diana Osana based on a short story by Annie Pru. Brokeback Mountain follows two cowboys, Ennis Del Mar, who's played by Heath Ledger in what I think is his best acting role, and uh, Jack Twist, who's played by Jake Gyllenhaal, who meet on a job in the summer of 1963. And what starts off as this kind of simple working relationship blossoms into something much more when these two men discover that they have romantic feelings for each other. In 2005, when this movie came out, 
now. It really is perhaps the last true forbidden love story, I think, in terms of at least the American zeitgeist, because 2005 was like the Bush years and it was like the height of neoconservatism. And like if you watched this movie, I think as like someone who grew up in a small town in Michigan, people would you know, make fun of you for watching a film like mm -hmm. this, especially since unlike a lot of tragic romances, which this film definitely is what I think Ang Lee and Annie Prue's short story show very intelligently is the tragedy of the love between Ennis and Jack is not that their love is like destructive, not to say that the relationship in this film doesn't have problems. It definitely does. But the tragedy at the end of the day is that Ennis and Jack can't be together. I think the cinema Photography by Rodrigo Prieto is stunning. Like he captures these vast mountain landscapes and these like sheep herds and these like, you know, Midwest flatlands where there's just like brush and adds just all this depth and texture of color in like every shot. But then on the flip side, like he shoots intimate scenes. Like, like those scenes are shot so, so well. And uh, Gustavo Santuala's score is very minimalistic. It's literally just like a guitar. At times, the world almost seems to disappear around these two men. There are no perfect people in this world, but there are people just trying to live and live happily. And as you said, ultimately, that's where the real tragedy of the story comes from. And, you know, not to quote verbatim, but there were an awful lot of, oh, it's the, the gay cowboys out in the wilderness movie. Mm -hmm. Okay, but it's also a incredibly human drama that gets details right about romance and intimacy and, and people together that a lot of romantic movies of the time and earlier in the noughties were completely missing the mark on us, at least in Hollywood. Yeah, it, it feels like an indie film at times yes. when you watch it because yeah. of how intimate it is. Okay, in comedy, I'm going to take the 2007 comedy Superbad, directed by yes. Greg Mottola and written yes. by Seth Rogen <laughs> and Evan Goldberg. Two inseparable best friends navigate the last week of high school and are invited to a house party where they must procure the alcohol. There's just so many like amazing scenes to this movie. It's like so quotable. I think it's like the most important like millennial comedy movie. It's so silly, but it works so well. It's it's almost like reminiscent of like another time in like comedy movies. Like you just, you don't really see anything like it. It's such a deviation, but it's still like so incredibly funny and quotable. Seth Rogen is a genius. <laughs> he is so funny. And a lot of this movie was based on his real experiences in school in Vancouver. It's not revealed until the very end of the film, but like, even though we have the surface level plot of like, oh, we need to get laid, we need to get beer, we need to like do all these things, like make people like us. It's there is this very vulnerable undercurrent that both, you know, Jonah Hill's character and Michael Sarah's character don't address fully. And that's the fact that it's like they're each other's like best friend. And in a very yeah. short time they will not be around each other anymore and those two characters inability to communicate mm -hmm. is what leads to so many of the like just hilarious moments yes in this movie yeah. as well. and the whole side plot with the cops and fogel is so funny and just watching <laughs> bill Hader and uh seth rogan just like having so much fun and it's just like their friendship is like so similar to evan and seth's friendship as well also just like shout out to like the intro of this movie where they're like just dancing mm -hmm. it's so great i love it yeah okay so for my kids slash animation i'm gonna go with Coraline um, mm. from 2009 the american stop motion animated dark fantasy horror film written and directed by henry Selick, based on neil gaiman's novella of the same name starring the vocal talent of dakota fanning and terry thatcher and keith david when Coraline moves into an old house she feels bored and neglected by her parents she finds a hidden door with a bricked up passage. During the night, she crosses the passage and finds a parallel world where everybody has buttons instead of eyes and caring parents and all of her dreams come true. This is one of the darkest movies I've ever seen and it's aimed for kids and I think it's a really good gateway horror film for kids as well. Uh, it's one of the most perfect stop motion films I've ever seen. Every single frame is a work of art. Just the emotions that the characters have all the time, especially um, my favorite is the other father and just like the way that he moves around is just 
so good, especially in the later half of the film when he kind of transforms a little bit. The music is incredible. Just all the voice acting is really good, especially Dakota Fanning. She does such a good job of sounding like a little bratty kid. I think we need more dark films like that for kids. What I think that movie embodies is Don Bluth's idea of you can show a child anything as long as you give it a happy ending. And I think Coraline does do that. But like he really takes her on this journey and it does such a good job of selling the world and the other world and making everyday objects as innocuous as like the buttons like completely horrifying like taking familiar things that a child would know and making them scary it's very easy to forget that what you're looking at would have been like crafted like very slowly frame by frame over a very long period of time it's absolutely perfect like i was saying it's a really good gateway horror movie for kids but it's also a really good movie for adults as well it reminds us to keep our childlike wonder and our imagination mm -hmm. and no matter how dark things are you can find the light in things and it's just, it's a very good story it's a really excellent coming of age story as well and overcoming your fears being mm -hmm. resilient there was a lot of little changes too between the book and the movie that really added to it like the character of yb was not in the book and adding him in the movie added like a whole other level mm -hmm. of like Coraline felt alone and she had no friends and then she met the only kid that she's ever met around her age in this town and she hates him she thinks he's annoying and like it's just it just felt very lonely it's another very lonely movie i guess that's my my jam uh my pick for female-led movie is um, easily one of the most underrated heartbreaking stories you'll ever see and very much based on true events that um, are even more harrowing and that would be 2002's uh, Peter Mullen directed The Magdalene Sisters. We follow three women during the 60s in Ireland, um, three women who are determined by the community or by the larger church to be fallen women, and I use that in quotes. They are considered um, less than they're considered to be sinners and they are sent to these institutions that really did exist throughout Ireland at the time and were not closed until the mid-90s called the Magdalene Laundries, which the church would sell to you as a place of learning and worship and growth for these women, when in actuality it was a system of slavery and repression and punishment and guilt. This movie is heartbreaking. This movie is an incredible expose of an extremely dark time in the history of Ireland and a time that is still very difficult for people who live through it to talk about. This is a film that deals very forcefully and very full on with the abuses that can happen behind the sort of mask of power and faith and the persecution of women on a fundamental level of morality. Everything that these women do is scrutinised and judged and whispered from family member to family member until where you would maybe have a victim, now the community only sees a troublemaker and a sinner who needs to be made better. The Magdalene Sisters is not an easy watch. It is an incredibly hard film to watch, but I consider it to be an incredibly important film to watch. Nearly every single character of importance is played by a woman, is a female character, and it is a story about women. It is a story about power. It is a story about the loss of control and coming together in bonds of defiance in the face of overwhelming oppression. This is an evil that you cannot say was of history's past mm. this is very close to now and mm. you know there are women still alive today who lived through this and I think I think this film does an incredibly good job of speaking for them um, so yeah following on from that I am going to go with my non-American pick and this I really had to think about and I had to think about it for a number of reasons and I have to go with Shinya Tsukamoto's 2002 masterpiece A Snake of June. Shinya Tsukamoto is kind of a hard filmmaker to sell. Very prolific filmmaker, very experimental filmmaker, very singular in his vision, very much a filmmaker who works in the cerebral, in the horror, and instead what we have here is a very short film. It is about an hour and 20 minutes. Um, it is entirely shot in monochromatic blue, so the entire frame from beginning to end is this dark, moody blue, and coupled with the environment of the movie, which is this constant downpour, this rain, this overwhelming force, that surrounds these characters. And in The Snake of June, we follow a frustrated housewife. And this woman is going about her day. She's she's very loving. She loves her husband, but her husband is racked with neuroses and racked with all these sort of issues that he can't quite overlook 
to give time to his wife, to make her feel seen and listened to and appreciated. This lady also works as a suicide prevention charity worker on a phone line, and it's through this work that she comes into contact with a man named Iguchi, played by Shinya Tsukamoto, who is a photographer of a very particular nature. Um, now, one day, she receives a letter in the mail, and this parcel contains Polaroids of her in her own bathroom in various states of... Com she's compromised, if we'll leave it at that. He then calls her and tells her that she can have the negatives back, but all she has to do is follow his instructions over the phone. It is one of the weirdest, most fascinating oddities to come out of Japan. It is it is a wholly original film. It is a film that deals with pink and repressed sort of feelings and brazen sexuality, and it is unapologetic about all of this, whilst also, as only Shinya Tsukamoto can, bringing this incredibly weird, fucked up, David Lynchian oddity to the entire thing. It is a film that you both will see coming a mile away, and yet also be completely unable to predict. Incredible soundtrack from Chu Ishikawa, um, who was a regular collaborator with Shinya Tsukamoto, who does absolutely astounding work here. Music that conveys a sense of absolute loneliness, and why it's not depression, but maybe a sense of just a low mood that hangs throughout the entire film and this sort of very repressed group of people who are all sort of withholding their true selves within and sort of as the film goes on as the rain keeps falling as people start to open up more just everything threatens to just burst out it is a wonderful film that I think anyone would be better for having seen whether that means they will like it or not is another question entirely but I will say you will not have seen anything like it before um okay I'm gonna move to a award winner and so this movie has won 14 awards mostly at film festivals i am going with howl's moving castle the 2004 japanese animated fantasy film written and directed by howie miyazaki loosely based on the 1986 novel of the same name when sophie a shy young woman is cursed with an old body by a spiteful witch her only chance of breaking the spell lies with a self-indulgent yet insecure young wizard and his companions in his walking castle like i said this film won 14 awards including Best Animated Film, Best Music, Best Foreign Director, Best Script, and many more. It is absolutely gorgeous. The music is so beautiful. The visuals are so beautiful. The writing is so beautiful. I love that it takes place around May Day as well. One of my favorite like pagan holidays. So there's like decorations in the town of it. It's, it's not mentioned, but it's just there. Easily Miyazaki's most political as well. And it's kind of surprising considering some of the other works, amazing works that he's done. I won't go too much into this, but the one thing I always have to give credit for when it turns up is a phenomenal soundtrack and um, Joe Hisashi I mean he's a phenomenal composer anyway his work in, in countless movies is some of the greatest you'll ever hear and here it's almost as if he saw Miyazaki firing on all cylinders and he said I'm not even going to try and give a percent less I'm <laughs> going to hit this full force and it just when this movie hits it hits like nothing else you're going to see there's an incredible voice cast in this in both the original Japanese Japanese and the American dub. They're both amazing. Like little little baby Josh Hutcherson is so adorable. Howl's Moving Castle is an amazing film. I think Merry Go Round of Life is probably Joe Hisaishi's best song that he ever wrote in any Ghibli movie, which is saying something because he mm -hmm. has written bangers in every film. For me, what it kind of does is it's like it's it's not so much concerned with having like a tight narrative about this girl who's been cursed and this like prince, you know, or this wizard i should say but it's more about the feelings it evokes in you the viewer and it's more about you going on this fantastical journey with sophie as she is you know experiencing all these things and the parallels to you know the war on terror are very obvious as an adult i think when i first saw this remember being like wow it's just like pretty but now as an adult i'm like ooh, miyazaki's kind of hitting with like these like bombing sequences <laughs> and like war sequences um but yeah it, it's a very good film and it's like it's a swing for the fences and for that it is like noteworthy for a very unique and singular director this is a very unique and singular entry just like the tonality of it it feels like dissimilar to his other works it feels like he, there's like something of like an underbelly in this movie that is like trying to burst out and you're right it's, you know it's thinking back on it now it's obviously really inspired by like the war in iraq but 
that contrasted with just like how beautifully animated it is as well is just like man like what a what an incredible filmmaker it's a very dark movie uh disguised as a very <laughs> happy movie with lots of yellows and flowers mm. and also calcifer is like the best character in any movie ever <laughs> and especially in the english version when mm-hmm. it's billy crystal gosh okay i'm gonna go to the female lead category i'm going to take the martial arts revenge epic written by quentin tarantino and uma thurman and directed by quentin tarantino kill bill volume one uma thurman plays the bride who is a former assassin who wakes up after a four-year coma after she was uh, well her ex-lover had attempted to murder her at said wedding to me when i watch this movie it feels like this feels like a kid in a candy store where he just went through and just grabbed like split screens from De Palma and like like Lady Snowblood and like a million other like visual uh, references that like he includes in here. It's a stunningly violent movie to watch and like a really great revenge movie and a really fascinating like middle point of Tarantino's career that like I've been thinking a lot more about recently. It's Quentin Tarantino at both like his most creative and his most indulgent and I don't mean that as a negative whatsoever. Absolutely insane homage to the Chanbara films of of the 70s in Japan, you know, Lady Snowblood, Grindhouse Cinema, you know, black exploitation films, spaghetti westerns. This film is, it's almost a ode, a sonnet to one of the greatest, most like outrageous periods in Hollywood history. Every single frame is just drenched with love and passion for the star that he's trying to, you know, show off or the movie that he's trying to call back to. And this is a film full of callbacks, but the most incredible thing about it is that it can be enjoyed with absolutely no knowledge of any of those movies. The yes. best thing about Kill Bill, you cannot understate just how brilliant, blistering, full-on an experience it is. As it whips from character to character, genre to genre, live action to animation in one of the most stunning middle fingers I've ever seen to a Hollywood movie-going audience in quite a while, where suddenly, yep, you're watching a 10-minute anime mm-hmm. sequence and we're not diluting this whatsoever. No. We are going to go for it with the same Z as the 90s manga VHS output where half of it was nearly banned. It's a film made with just absolute love for what came before and you have to respect it for that even knowing that it is also on its own merit a marvellous marvellous movie. There's so much going on. You mentioned the animated sequence when we're getting over in Ishii's backstory incredible. The black and white scene when she's fighting the crazy 88 also incredible. Also probably the first movie that I remember seeing that isn't told chronologically and that kind of blew my mind as well. Kill Bill is so, I think personally it's like Tarantino at his most stylistic. Of course he pays homage to, you know, these other great films like Lady Snowblood in particular, but he infuses it with his own viewpoints and that is why I think it works. This time I'm going to do my animation slash children's family movie uh, and for my pick I had to go with the 2009 Wes Anderson film Fantastic Mr. Fox. Co- written by Wes Anderson and Noah Baumbach and based on Roald Dahl's 1970 children's novel of the same name. Fantastic Mr. Fox stars George Clooney and Meryl Streep alongside Wes Anderson regulars uh, Jason Schwartzman, Willem Dafoe, Bill Murray. Fantastic Mr. Fox follows this fox who's kind of a rogue with a heart of gold. Back in the day, he was kind of like a criminal committing all these like hen house robberies and capers and eventually his wife convinces him to settle down and start a family family, but he's always had this like hankering to go on one last ride. One day, under the guise of helping his family, he decides to sneak back onto a farm and steal some chickens. And the film is about the domino effect of everything that happens after that decision. I just got to say, first off, I think the real hero of Fantastic Mr. Fox is the cinematographer Tristan Oliver and the team of stop motion animators who worked on this film because it is one of the coziest looking films. I've ever seen. It's a film I watch every Thanksgiving, like, or fall time. It is just so warm and beautiful, but also this very touching and tender film about, like, family and belonging and legacy and kind of having a midlife crisis and dealing with things that are unresolved in your past and unresolved things about yourself. 
going back to the stop motion, I have a compilation saved on my YouTube of all the behind the scenes footage because what they did with the actors when they were going in to animate the clay figures, they had like George Clooney and, you know, the cast, they would act out the scenes like at like a dinner table or on a motorbike and they would take the actors real actions and inflections that they recorded from that and then put that into the stop motion, which makes it more real. You almost forget you're watching animals at points. You really feel like you're watching like this family kind of go through it. But then you realize, oh, uh, you see Michael Gambon like tear up his trailer. And then you see like the badger played by Bill Murray, like do something like very animalistic. It's a great family film. It's a very cozy film. It's a beautifully animated film. I really like Fantastic Mr. Fox. I really do love this movie. I think it's um, Wes like turning up the whimsy to, to maximum a little bit for my taste. Just like a really, really unique like pit stop along the way of his filmography. And every time I watch mm. it, I sort of love going down this weird sort of like weird little world that he's created my second pick uh, we're gonna hop over to the horror category for my horror film I chose the 2007 Spanish found footage horror film, Wreck. Co-written and co-directed by Jean Balaguero and Paco Plaza, Wreck follows a television news crew covering a team of firefighters who respond to an emergency call at an apartment building. However, top officials arrive on the scene and lock our heroes inside the apartment complex with no explanation. It soon becomes apparent that there is something terrifying going on inside this apartment building. What makes Wreck so interesting is that it also takes the zombie apocalypse genre and marries it with found footage in an interesting way. What makes found footage very hard to pull off from a suspension of disbelief standpoint is you need a reason as to why the cameras would keep rolling after something really horrific happens. And Wreck does that flawlessly. The whole thing with the news crew and the firefighters and like the point, the points where it's like, you know, they're isolated and they need light and perhaps the camera's the only source of light. Something that Wreck does really, really well too that a lot of horror I think struggles with is it keeps upping the ante. It's almost video gamey the way the movie is structured because it's like you start on the bottom level of this apartment building and every time the characters go up a floor as they're trying to figure out what's going on, new hazards, new obstacles, new horrors are thrown at them. I won't spoil what happens in this film, but the climax is terrifying and it is because of a great mix-up of, one, just really amazing writing, but two, like, great acting, but three, the marrying of, like, a really cool practical effect with a really cool digital effect, and just the way it's presented is so good. Rec understands why found footage can be scary and understands effectively how to use it. It is not merely a point of putting a camera in a room and just letting the clock run. Something about Rec that works so well in tandem and with the found footage nature of the film is the fact that everybody, despite being very, very good in the role, they do not come across like actors. They do not come across like players on a stage. They come across exactly like real people. And I think to do it any other way ruins the effect. But Wreck understands. First and foremost, absolute terror and suspense is the name of the game, and it comes swinging. Mm -hmm. I think it's an incredible movie. I think it holds up even better today than mm -hmm. um, a lot of other choices might. I'm gonna I'm gonna try sneaking the movie now into my horror pick i will take the from the year 2000 directed by kenji fukasaku um Ooh. battle royale <laughs> battle royale is about a class of uh, ninth graders i believe who are forced to fight each other to the death on an abandoned island for entertainment purposes. When I think about watching this, like particularly as a teenager, it's one of like the best teenage movies I've ever seen. Like the weird clicks and like awkward romance and the way that students like team up together is like, it's so true to real life. I really love the like dystopian feel to the movie as well. Again, just like the hyper violence and like perverseness to it is um, really unsettling and effective. Battle Royale is a film that many have tried and in my opinion utterly fallen flat on their face trying to imitate and fundamentally because they miss the point. This is one of the darkest black comedy films I've ever yes. seen that mm -hmm. also completely nails as you said Dylan that school experience, the cliques the interpersonal relationships the adult child divide and the hatred of authority or the, not even the hatred, the anarchic tendency to rebel against 
authority. Takeshi Kitano in this film is outstanding. One of my favourite directors here doing one of the funniest, most unhinged performances I've seen in a film like this. His teacher character is absurd, sympathetic, pitiful, horrifying, hilarious. There are so many moments in the film where you should be horrified and shocked. There is a marvellous Mexican standoff sequence in the film that is one of the funniest farcical scenes in any other movie, but yet mm -hmm. also plays as horrifying as it is. It is horrific to see this destruction unfold. It's not just horror. It's not just thriller. It's not just action. It's not just comedy. All these aspects come together to tell this very socially conscious story about like teenagers, but it's just presented in this off the wall way. So I have left female lead and comedy. This is really, really, really hard, but I think I will be doing myself and my family friends a disservice if I do not choose School of Rock. Um, from 2003, the comedy film directed by Richard Linklater, written by Mike White, starring Jack Black, Joan Cusack, Mike White, Sarah Silverman, my family friend, Kevin Clark, rest in peace. Inspired from his band and hard up for cash, guitarist and vocalist Dewey finagles his way into a job as a fifth grade substitute teacher at a private school, where he secretly begins teaching his students the finer points of rock and roll. The school's hard-nosed principal is rightly suspicious of his activities, but his roommate remains in the dark about what he's doing. Doing. This is one of my favorite movies. It's in my top 10. I grew up uh, adjacent to a couple of the kids that were in this. Growing up in Chicago, my cousins went to school with them. Like, I saw the Backstreet Boys in concert with Kevin Clark. This movie, I don't know, it's so funny. It's so quotable. It's so well written. The kids are all amazing. The acting is not super great from them, but it's it's so real for that. Like, they're, they're so believable as kids. I think the only kid in the movie that was, like, famous at the time was Miranda Cosgrove and that was like peak Nickelodeon. Richard Linklater is an amazing amazing director and what it is is it's like not just a love letter to rock and roll but it is this very deep vulnerable and funny take on how music inspires people and how music can change someone's life. It, it's it's always nice to see Jack Black and things. It's even nicer when he's in the movie equivalent of just the warmest, comfiest hug. Not to say that it doesn't have any sort of like plot to contend with or, you know, peaks and valleys to get through, but it is a film that is just so overwhelmingly focused on making you feel nice mm -hmm. and happy throughout. And it does so almost effortlessly. This was Richard Linklater is such a fascinating film maker and this was arguably the beginning of one of his biggest upswings in the noughties. In the auditions for the kids, they weren't looking for kids who could act. They were looking for kids who could play instruments. And so a lot of them like weren't actors. They were just kids who knew how to play an instrument or sing. And it just kind of worked out that they all like did well. And it was because they were all so close. They were all really good friends on set. And a lot of them are still friends today. That also pays off because they're not there trying to put on some great acting performance or trying to upstage each other or anything like that yeah. because that's not even a factor. They are there purely to be themselves and play instruments, which they do yeah. fantastically. It, it's a real testament to Richard Linklater's versatility that he could just like get into his bag and make something like this. It also happens to be like there are certain actors who do certain things really well, and this is I cannot think of like a more perfect vehicle for a single actor than School of Rock for Jack Black. The casting is great, not just the kids but the adults. Like my favorite performance in the film is actually Lucas Babin, who's not an actor anymore. He's like a district attorney, but he plays Spider, who has like two lines of dialogue in the film, but he's so memorable as is this very strange, like long haired, like leather daddy. Everyone plays a part in this film. Sarah Silverman, too, I think in one of her like first film roles, Mike White, Ned Schneebly, the like pushover, like roommate who is once the lead singer of Maggot Death. Also one of, if not the first film to use Led Zeppelin music music in it because they they were very stingy with like their licensing well i'm gonna go straight into the award winner and i've got to go with 2007's andrew dominic directed the assassination of jesse james by the coward robert ford i think that the fact that an australian director in andrew dominic understands the western genre and the tragedy of hero worship and of the cult of personality and crafts this marvelous revisionist epic. I don't want to look down upon other westerns, but this film is a masterpiece. I am trying my best not to gush 
it on so many levels it is less of a movie and more of a novel it is read in this wonderful dreamlike with a voice that feels like treacle or tobacco smoke or it's just this gravelly soft taking you through this incredibly sad pitiful tale i think it's got some of the greatest performances of the decade brad pitt is outstanding as jesse james he really gets the idea of not playing this mythical legendary figure as a mythical legendary figure but someone haunted by that very status and someone with very real problems and mental issues that are completely ignored and not even taken into consideration by anybody in his life to everybody he is this cult like figure whether he wants to be or not and Brad Pitt plays that astoundingly well you've also then got an absolute one two punch I mean the entire cast is terrific we, we could be here all day. These are incredible talents who here are completely working out of their comfort zone and in the process delivering some of the best dramatic work you're likely to see. This film goes places. It is not epic just on a scale of taking place in the American frontier in this vast Wild West existence. It deals with epic ideas. It deals with epic figures and the effect of that worship, that hero worship, that myth making, that legend legend making what that actually does to the people who are being made myths and legends of i actually just saw this movie for the first time this year i'm in chicago and there's this historical theater here called the music box they had a 35 millimeter screening of the film and roger deakins was in attendance with uh, his wife and script supervisor uh, james ellis for a post film q a and i remember sitting down in this theater and just feeling like the light and the text texture of the cinematography and like just the texture of each shot gut wrenching performances like you've mentioned he talked at length about how he and Andrew Dominic you know wanted a novel like feeling for the film and it's so great that you mentioned that because I think that means it's successful it's almost got like a it's got like an Andre Tarkovsky feel that like Andrew Dominic like captured where it's just like this film lets you the audience kind of ponder in what you're seeing as this like slow burn of the fall of hero worship happens like right before your eyes. And it's it's about, you know, yes, America and yes, the West and yes, like law and order and manifest destiny, but the price people will go to for fame and what comes with it. I am so blown away by it this movie and i think brad pitt is like just remarkable but man that casey affleck performance is something else it's one of those performances that you watch and it just stays with you it's so pitiful and there's a way that like the cameras linger on a shot and there's also the way that the film itself lingers on towards the end in in a way that like you know you, you're, you're past like the the titular events of the film itself and you're sort of just moseying about almost it's there's a there's like a real sadness to it and it, it's incredible to watch it's 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 a singular western it's a film i've loved since the first moment i saw it and it will remain with me forever also such a prolific score that nick cave is in the movie himself um so yeah that's my um that's my award winner so i think i'm on to my final pick which is the kid slash animation and i i very much did a lot of back and forth on this topic based on the graphic novel of the same name um directed by marjan satrapi and and Vincent Parano. Um, it's 2007's Persepolis, a absolutely beautiful, tragic, overwhelmingly emotional, monochrome animated movie following a young girl as she comes of maturity and comes of age against the backdrop of the Iranian Revolution. It's an incredible story. Obviously, the film is based on the graphic novel of the same name, which is based on Marjan's personal experiences of growing up in Iran as a teenage girl. I think there are a few things that this film does incredibly well. I think it will come as a surprise to nobody. I am not a 14 year old girl. However, this film along with um, another one from the 90s, um, a Studio Ghibli film, remain the only two films I can think of that have made me feel like this character. Feel what this character's feeling and not have that disconnect of this person's from a different place than me. This person's a different gender than me. This person has a different lived experience for me. It is an animated film. It is a kid's friendly animated film but it is as close to a punch in the face as any animated film I can think of from this time in terms of just showing you what Marjan and women like her went 
went through during this period in history. It follows her from Iran out into the world as she experiences heartbreak and loss and freedom, but all that freedom brings, including the good emotions and the bad. And it is a film that ultimately just wants you to understand the experience of this character. And I think it does so perfectly. It is a heartbreaking movie, I think, because it deals, you know, with a loss of innocence and like a loss of faith in like the world around her. And it kind of is like my pick in the sense where there are times when I watched that movie and I just rewatched it recently where you kind of forget you're watching an animated film and you kind of feel like you're just in this other world. It is like haunting and it's gorgeous and sad and beautiful and it's an incredible film and I'm very glad you chose it. So for my horror pick, I went with 2004's Dumplings directed by Fruit Chan. My comedy pick was Scott Sanders's 2009 comedy Black Dynamite. My uh, kid slash animation film was 2007's uh, Persepolis, directed by Marjan Satrapi and Vincent Parano. Uh, my award-winning film was The Assassination of Jesse James by the Coward Robert Ford, by uh, uh, directed by Andrew Dominic, uh, released in 2007. Uh, my female-led movie was 2002's The Magdalene Sisters, directed by Peter Mullen. And finally, my non-American film, 2002's A Snake of June, directed by Shinya Tsukamoto. All right, so this is my last choice. This is my female lead. I'm going to go with Josie and the Pussycats <laughs> from 2001. It's a satirical musical comedy directed and co-written by Harry Elfont and Deborah Kaplan, based on the Archie comic series and the cartoon of the same name. Starring Rachel Lee Cook, Tara Reid, Rosario Dawson, Alan Cumming, and many more wonderful people. Um, Josie, Melody, and Val are three small town girl musicians determined to take their rock band out of the garage and straight to the top, while remaining true to their look, style, and sound. They get a record deal which brings fame and fortune, but they soon realize they are pawns of two people who want to control the youth of America. They must clear their names, even if it means losing the fame and fortune. This movie is so ahead of its time on the commentary that it's making, where there's like the subliminal messaging under the music and it makes people buy things like it's so relevant to the life that we live in now with all the ads hidden and everything and it's so funny the way it's written i i never read the archie comics or watched the cartoon but so my context of joe's and the pussycats is this movie it's very cool also the music is amazing uh it's not rachel lee cook singing it's another i cannot remember who it is but it's a singer of a band that was popular at the time doing the singing for them them, but I I don't know. I was obsessed with uh, Tara Reed's character Melody when I was a kid. I think I was her for Halloween for like three years in a row. Uh, she's like the dumb blonde character and she was just so adorable. This movie was a big part of my childhood and it still is one of my favorite movies. My lineup for horror, I took Saw, Comedy, School of Rock, uh, Kids slash Animation, Coraline. My award winner was Howl's Moving Castle. My non-American was Let the Right One In and my female lead it was Josie and the Pussycats. Okay, so I've left kids in animation. I'm going to pick the 2008 science fiction animated film Wally -E by Andrew Stanton. Mm. Yes. Um, man, okay, so. It's 800 years into the future. Earth has been left uninhabitable by pollution and just humanity's degradation of our planet. And left to clean up the mess is a Wally uh, unit. He lives with his best friend, a cockroach, and is one day visited by an Eve unit who is sent to look for human life. They bond over Hello Dolly. <laughs> and yeah, our story sort of kicks off from there. For me, and I kind of like ending the draft with a bit of a hot take, this is like far and away Pixar's best work. This movie works like so well on so many different levels for me personally. Um, it's such an incredibly beautiful romance movie. Warnings about like environmentalism and like also just like how funny it is as well. The scene of the two of them dancing in space together is just like crushes me every time I watch it. Every time I see the end of that movie and like there's a factory reset that goes on, it just kills me inside. This is 
is a movie that like I never fail to cry when I'm watching it. It's a it's a gut punch. I love it so much. It's yeah, one of my favorite movies of all time. It is the most heartwarming, heartbreaking, wonderfully inventive Odyssey. It consistently surprises me in terms of how well it juggles the double act that it does. It's very it's a very hard sell to most audiences, but especially to children to say you need to bear with us for the first half of this movie where the only sound you were going to hear is the occasional word from Eve or Wally and a little bit of music or played back footage. But other than that, we're really not giving you much. It's all visual storytelling. And the visual storytelling is pulled off impeccably. I, I just want to quickly mention like the, the silent movie of it all. Like it really is like watching like a Charlie Chaplin movie. Those first mm. sequences of him like walking around and just like interacting with things and finding the diamond ring and throwing it away so he can play with the hinge. Like it's so beautiful and also the only like non-animated part of the movie where fred willard shows up as the ceo ceo of earth and is like hey we blew it we got to get out of here mm-hmm. it's like just like it kills me every time he it just it's so funny so in horror i took the 2000 movie battle royale in comedy i selected the 2007 greek matola super bad in animated and kids i selected Andrew Stanton's Wally. In female lead, I selected the Quentin Tarantino revenge epic Kill Bill Volume 1. In international, I selected Park Chan Wook's 2003 Old Boy. And in award winner, I selected Paul Thomas Anderson's 2007 American classic There Will Be Blood. All right. Um, I guess it's up to me. I started the snake and now I'm going to end the snake. So my last category is comedy. And for my comedy pick, I I had to go with the ultimate prank comedy film, which is 2001's Freddy Got Fingered. Oh, uh, directed no. by no. Directed by Tom Green wow. and written by Green and Derek Harvey. Uh, starring Tom Green and Rip Torn. So, Freddy Got Finger, Freddy Got Fingered, excuse me, is a film where Tom Green plays an animator named Gord, who is struggling to make his big break in Hollywood and deal with his comically abusive father. Uh, when Gord's dreams don't work out and he's forced to move back in with his family, he fabricates a rumor that his father has been molesting his younger brother. Freddy. I genuinely think this film is genius, multi-layered surrealist comedy at its finest. It is a prank comedy film, and the prank is on the studio because Tom Green <laughs> convinced some studio to give him $15 million in order to make this film, and he purposefully wasted the money and made an artistic statement real. The film itself is a very smart evisceration, I would say, of big studio comedies, and particularly the American 19- 1990s Hollywood comedy formula. It just completely shits all over that formula in the film. And it does this thing where it will lampshade what movies are supposed to do, and it will do something just because the movie wants it, and then it will make fun of it. Uh, It's a lot like Wreck in the sense where it starts off intense, and it just keeps getting more and more intense and gross as it goes on, and it just makes fun of Hollywood and the American dream and making it big and like this obsession we have with like healing from family trauma and stuff. It is a very irreverent film and it is just so funny and it is it's a movie I quote weekly. It's so so funny. It's ahead of its time and very famously hated by everyone when it came out and it's only just recently that it's been I think recognized as the work of comic genius that it is. At the beginning of your description, you you sort of slightly mispronounced Freddy Got Fingered, and then you said, forgive me. And I'm very sorry, but I don't think I can. <laughs> <laughs> Bring up Freddy Got Fingered. Um, it's very complex because I'm half with you, and I'm half absolutely infuriated <laughs> that you would dare regarding Tom Green's intentions with this movie. I absolutely think that it is intended as a middle finger to the studio system. I think that he mm. couldn't believe his luck that they were willing to write him a blank check, and he went, I am just going to go nuts with this, and I'm going to rope everyone I can 
ran in. Rip Torn is ridiculously funny in this movie. Um, there is a level of physicality to the amount of pain he puts Tom Green through. Mm -hmm. As an actual movie, I know, you know, I'm almost happy that the film has found its audience and, and has its its lovers. I think as a surrealist like joke, it is an absolute ace of spades, well played. Tom Green has my respect because that is a brilliant balancing act to pull off and, and as a statement in itself, it's it's genius. As a movie, I don't think I've ever agreed with Roger Ebert more. <laughs> as like a satire, it does such a good job of making fun of all of the things, but also being a really good example of the things that it's making fun of. I love when that happens. I think the reason that people are recognizing it now more than they did when it came out is because when it came out, people were so shocked and offended by it. And now people are understanding that it's a joke and it was on purpose. I mean, I will give that film, I will give Freddy Got Finger credit for this. It's not often that a film can both make me cackle out loud and a legitimate witch is Sanderson's sister's cackle and yet an hour earlier infuriate and disgust me to the yeah. point that I wanted to switch it off. I have tried to show this movie to people like a handful of times and I always preface it with just it's just just trust me. I'll list uh, my pick. So for horror, I had 2007's Wreck, co-directed by Jean Balaguero and Paco Plaza. Uh, for comedy, I had 2001's Freddy Got Fingered, directed by Tom Green. For uh, animated children's movie, I chose 2009's Fantastic Mr. Fox, directed by Wes Anderson. For my award winner, I chose Brokeback Mountain, the 2005 Academy Award winner, directed by Ang Lee. Uh, for my international non-American film. I chose 2008's Love Exposure directed by Shion Sono and for my female lead, I had 2001's Mulholland Drive directed by David Lynch. That is a, that is a fantastic draft pick, I've got to say. The, the, the entire draft, it's great. Yes, mm. I'm so excited that like a really big chunk of these movies I haven't seen, so I have more movies to add to my watch list. The time has come that we have all been waiting for honorable mentions. Big runner-up in the horror category was um, absolutely Martyrs from 2008. Mm. Um, I had quite a few on the horror area. Um, Takeshi Miike's Audition. Another pick was um, Lars von Trier's Antichrist. Also, uh, Takeshi Miike's 2001 Grindhouse horror classic Ichi the Killer. For my horror, I had uh, Donnie Darko, the 2002 American remake of The Ring, Final Destination. There's a lot of really good horror movies. The only one that I had on my long list that hasn't been mentioned yet was um, Mary Hannon's American Psycho. For my list, uh, my backups for horror were The Ring, uh, mm -hmm. the American remake, uh, M. Night Shyamalan's Signs, and paranormal activity so another found footage yeah. my three backups that i had for comedy uh, were mean girls Shaun of the dead and shanghai noon and my comedy backups i had hot fuzz Step Brothers, which is just like the most insanely quotable movie of all time uh zoolander mm -hmm. and to close it out a bit more category fraud i don't know how funny it is but punch drunk love for me for comedy pretty much all of my backups got chosen actually like my backups for freddie got fingered just just in case someone was unhinged like me and choosing that were uh, Black Dynamite, Super Bad were two of my backups. And then my third backup was uh, Meet the Parents. Um, I only had a couple for comedy. Um, Jane Silent Bob Strike Back was one of them. I am an avid um, patron of the Viewers Universe. Um, also along with, along that list was Clucks 2. Also on that list was uh, Zack and Mary Make a Porno, another Kevin Smith film. Two others afterwards, and these are a little bit um, out of left field. 2000's Coen Brothers movie oh brother where art thou the second choice was my number one up until was my main pick up until we started filming and that is 2006's comic masterpiece jackass number two okay for kids oh my god this was the section that was killing me so harry potter actually i think the first like six of them are in this decade and they were all very influential to me spy kids one and two mm. shrek nice. uh monsters inc my backups for kids as an animation was shrek shrek two yeah. uh and and Treasure Planet. Yeah, yeah. award Lord winners. Monster. I had oh, uh, Spirited Away, uh, Monster House, Little Miss Sunshine. Award winners probably my most stacked category in terms of backup picks. I couldn't, for example, pick The Return of the King, 2007 Zodiac, directed by David Fincher, mm. Lost in Translation, Sofia Coppola's yep. magnificent Tale of Loneliness, Christopher Nolan's 2008 film The Dark Knight, 2002's Brazilian masterpiece City of God, 
Master and Commander, The Far Side of the World, Perfume Story of a Murderer, the Tom Twyker. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I haven't seen that one. I had all of those movies on my list apart from Perfume. The one I did have that was missing from yours is No Country for Old Men. Yeah, all of my backups were on your list, Kai, except for one, uh, which was Alexander Payne's Sideways. Um, yes. For non American, mm-hmm. I was so sure that I was going to pick like, the right one in that I didn't even bother like writing descriptions of my other movies, but the other ones that I had written down were wreck um the original shutter the thai one not the american remake and uh pan's labyrinth for me non-american i only had two backups we both talked about them pan's labyrinth was one and then the other was hot fuzz there are only two non-american picks for me in the mood for love and i'm not entirely sure of this counts but um alfonso caron's children of men I could have picked Barking Dogs Never Bite. I could have picked Mother. Uh, mm. I could have picked The Host. The one I really wanted to pick was um, Memories of Murder. Two more movies that I desperately need to shout out from the international category because mm. I, I can feel the New Zealand secret police like listening in right now and about to make a move. The Fellowship of the Ring is amazing. And also Stephen Chow's Kung Fu Hustle. Right. Female led. I had Charlie's Angels, Miss Congeniality, uh, Uptown Girls, uh, Triangle. If Mohan i've got picked at another david lynch film inland empire uh starring uh, laura dern the only female lead pick that hasn't been mentioned yet that i just wanted to throw out was ang lee's crouching tiger hidden dragon well thank you guys so much for being here for this i feel like you absolutely were, yeah you thank you for having me perfect choices for this decade you guys are very passionate about all the movies that you chose which makes me very happy yeah. no this was a yeah. pleasure thank yeah, you this so was much fun. For <laughs> yeah thank you this was great do you guys want to do some shout outs if you guys enjoyed me and want to see more of what I talk about and write, uh, you can follow me over on Letterboxd at the Burke Nation. Uh, you can also find me on Instagram and Twitter at Eric W. Burke. Also under Eric W. Burke on YouTube, I upload very infrequently, so I apologize uh, for that. Also, I have a book out you can buy, which is a horror novel called Vampires. You can type in Vampires by Eric Burke on Amazon. Uh, so yeah, that's where you can find me and support me. In terms of shout outs, I mean, I haven't got much. I'm um, obviously, as I said at the beginning, um, I'm easily found on letterbox my name is kai russell but you can find me on letterbox under unethical night i'm on there a little infrequently at the moment but um, i tend to be putting out reviews quite often i'm also on youtube under unethical night but um that is much more of a throwaway um channel that's just where i have my stupid little editing fun also produce music on spotify under the name kdead i'm currently writing a proper draft of a feature-length script um titled dogs bite back everyone knows what it's like adulting is hard you just <laughs> <laughs> where you can to write but if i ever make some serious headway on that i will um definitely share that and shout it out on letterbox and beyond um and again thank you guys so much for having me it's been yeah. so good to have both of you i'm so happy with how this turned out your lineups are amazing i can't wait to watch so many movies that i haven't seen before anytime and and i i think i speak for both me and eric i think we would love to come back on so yeah i would i would definitely love kai you're right on the money <laughs> i'm shamelessly putting back. myself forward now just both indexing this together just come <laughs> I will. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching this decade draft. This was a really fun one to record and so much of it needed to be cut out just to condense it down. There will be tons of clips uploaded to Patreon very soon, including a full hour of just the honorable mentions. We have one more decade to cover, but that is not the end of the draft series. We will be doing so many more of these, so keep a lookout and make any suggestions of themes or categories that you have in the comments. Also, please tell us which lineup you liked the best and which movies you would have chosen for your lineup. Like I mentioned, we have a Patreon which is only $1 per month where you can see unedited versions of our videos, bonus content, commentary tracks, and more. It really helps support us and we really appreciate it. We also have a Discord server to chat with community members and gush about movies, so join that if that sounds like something that you would enjoy. Follow myself and Dylan on Letterboxd to see all of our reviews and give our amazing guests a follow as well. All of the links are in the show notes down below. Ring the bell for notifications so when we upload you don't miss any of our videos and we'll see you in the next one. Bye!